Dear friends, hello. Happy to see you. I want to introduce a very interesting guest. His name is Dave Crane. This is a very optimistic person. Never in my life I saw that person that he's not smiling. This person is UN virtual broadcaster, public speaking coach, on online presentation skills uh, for leaders he's teaching, and he's a great presenter. He met a lot of celebrities and he speaks very well from all any stage in the world. Hello, Dave. How are you? It's great to be here. Great to be here as well with you. Uh, dear Dave, uh, you are the person who really always in good mood and I never saw you upset. You're always very, very positive. And I think you work so hard. I know that I saw you at many events in Dubai. You were MC, you were host, you were doing it very easily and ve very nicely. Very Thank entertaining, you. I should say. Uh, so you became a brand yourself. So I want to know what is a brand for you and how did you manage to build your personal brand? Well, I think the challenge of creating a brand is you have to make it so it's very much that you are being you, but you have to choose the best version of you that's going to work best for your audience and for ultimately the product or the services or the skill set that you want to sell. So there's three elements that come into your branding, who you believe you should be seen as, what your audience sees you as, and what you don't want people to see. Somewhere in there is the one that you choose and is a constant change because life changes all the time. So sometimes you'll do something that's really useful and you want that to be part of your brand. And sometimes you do something that you don't like and people will see it anyway. So you want to play it down as your brand. But ultimately what, what's changed, especially since the lockdown, is more and more people need to understand that your name is now your brand. So if you are hiding behind a company name, people will see you on social media and whatever your name comes up as, that is you. So if you don't have what people should be finding when they look for you, then people will be suspicious or they'll go and work with somebody else. So you should only put out there what you want people to find, but at the same time, you should cultivate and grow the messages that you need people to like about you. So wherever they find you on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, it should all be the same kind of quality. So they instantly say, this is somebody I trust, and this is somebody that will deliver what I need them to. So I want to work with them. Um, so you are saying that you should be the same in on all social media, and that should be one clear message. So you cannot be in one social media, you are doing so and so, on the other social media, you are doing so and so, then people will be not sure who you are. That well, is that. Social media platforms are like going to a party. LinkedIn is like going to a party wearing a suit. Instagram is like going to a party at the beach. Facebook is like going around to friends party but there's going to be people you know and people you don't know so you address accordingly and you talk about things accordingly so each platform has its own way of doing stuff i mean linkedin i'm probably strongest on linkedin and it's really boring as a platform it's like facebook in a suit but i know pretty much how i want the people to understand me and i also know that people on, on linkedin consider your work and consider doing business with you so everybody has a different platform that they prefer. And I think the change is for influencers in the past, they would just say, look at me, I'm great, give me money and I'll talk about me. But I think now what you're after is less of an audience and more people who are in your industry or in your niche who want to see you as an expert in that particular field. So you have a really deep relationship with your audience, but a lot, le a lot less people in it. And from the advertiser's point of view, they want to connect with people who has a ready-made audience around them rather than somebody who just reaches everybody. So for instance, LinkedIn, if you're, on, if you're on any platform and you have a lot of people that love you, eating food, dressing up, having a laugh, Rolls-Royce might want to reach your 8,000 or 8 million people. But if your 8 million people are not interested in buying a Rolls-Royce, why should they sponsor your show? So you have to think about who that you want to reach. And ultimately, there's a niche called a micro-influencer that has something between 10,000 and 100,000 connections. That's a sweet spot. 
because you stay in your lane and in your niche with your business. You don't, you can answer every message, every call, every contact who gets in touch with you. You can answer back and you can still do very well and create a great relationship before it grows out of control and you've got to get somebody else in to help you do your social media. That is a very smart answer indeed. So no need to grow your audience to the extent that you cannot control it. Let it be 5,000, 10,000 people, but you can answer them directly. You can know who are they. You know, in a way it's like customer discovery. First you study who your audience is and then you can present yourself. Uh, Dave Crane is so-and-so, you are specialist in public speaking. And there will be no, uh, you know, this connection, because I know that you can be in many fields. I know you love your family very much. You love your daughter very much. And she is, uh, when you building your brand, uh, even, you know, today you said that the good time for me is two o'clock by Dubai, because it will not, uh, it will be very comfortable for my daughter. And I think that is the greatest answer of the father who is thinking about homeschooling really and protecting the interests uh, of his family and his daughter. And uh, really, I love that. I really, I love that. Let's go to the topic number two. What is uh, who you are? Because you are the master of public speaking. And I want to know, Dave, how you recommend us, people who are now behind the screens, um, how we should talk to our audience, how we should uh, promote ourselves, how we should speak from the screen? Well, I think it's a combination of getting an audience and also getting the audience to understand who you are, what you stand for, and also how you monetize that relationship with your audience. So for instance, I see a lot of people on social media with big audiences, huge responses, everything they put out, people comment on, but very little that they put out has anything to do with their actual job or their brand. They're just showing people shiny videos of cats getting rescued or, or somebody doing something spectacular and they say, isn't this wonderful? And everyone says yes, but you can't draw a direct line between that yes and their bank account. So I think what you need to do is think about what you actually want. Do you want an audience because it makes you feel better and you know your job is safe so you can quite happily just do social media for fun? Or do you want to have a second job where you create a relationship with your audience? In which case you don't want huge numbers, you want deep relationships, you wanna create a tribe. So I think the best way to do it is to work out first of all, who is your, work about first of, first of all, who you are. What is it that I do? What do I wanna monetize? And what is my audience? Who are they? What age are they? Which country are they in? What is their religion? What is their, their, their culture, their politics? Why should they like my stuff? And then you create a relationship between creating the content that they would like and also reaching them. Somewhere in that, that content should be you. So what you do, it's like me going out, but wearing a hat. That It's still me, but I'm wearing a hat because the people that I'm meeting are all wearing hats. So you have to create a version of you that's correct for that particular audience. And it may be that you lose a lot of people who aren't as serious or don't really care about it. That's fine, let them go to do something else. But if you want to monetize and create a relationship with your brand, then you have to really consider what do they want and give them more of that. If you don't do it, they'll go to somebody else who gives them what, with what they want and you'll miss out. It's really hard to get somebody else's audience back. Whereas if you can create it from scratch, it will grow organically and the people will tell other people. And before you know it, everyone's into your thing. And I think that nowadays, especially since lockdown, and we have to start creating a relationship digitally with everybody, it's a really smart idea to move in that direction. Uh, it is easy to say, but difficult to do. I think it's easy for you, Dave, because you're a born speaker and uh, I think uh, organically you like to speak. This is your nature. This is your, this is your character. You love to speak. You, you like to entertain. And uh, you told me you were working before on radio, yeah? Radio and TV, but I don't think that that is the, the only thing that matters. There's lots of people who work on radio and TV who can't work with a live audience and are not very good at social media. The most important thing is to be humble 
and not say me, 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 because nobody cares about me. Nobody cares about Dave Crane. They only care what can Dave Crane give me that will make my life better. So that's the message you've got to cultivate. You've got to think about what I have and how can I get it to the people who want it? And don't charge them money for it straight away because what they want to see is the proof that they invest time and energy with you that you can deliver what they need. And it's a marketing game of giving them as much as you can do. Now, the key to it is actually a very special way of doing it. You teach people what the problem is, but you don't tell them how to solve it. So you can give lots and lots of what. Do you find this is a challenge? Do you find this is a problem? Have you ever discovered this? But if you tell them how to fix it, they don't need you. So you have to let them come to you and hire your services or buy your products to find out how to do it. And one of the things that's changed is people don't want to buy a package, open it up and then do things. People want you to do it with them or do it for them. So that, again, is why it's more important to have a small but really close audience than it is to go out there and have millions of millions who, who won't spend with you because they don't get a real relationship with you. Uh, it's very, it's very true that, you know, the small audience who believe in you, who needs you and who want to buy your product will be more beneficial for your, uh, will be more beneficial than people who just watching you out of curiosity, sometimes watching, sometimes not. What do you think, what is your biggest challenge as a businessman, as a public speaker, um, what is the biggest uh, challenge and what are the mistakes that you did that now you will not recommend to others to, to, to repeat that mistakes when building your brand? Great question. I think the challenge is to make sure your ego doesn't control everything. And the biggest challenge that you have to have is to always be uncomfortable, always be outside your comfort zone. As soon as your comfort zone becomes comfortable, get out of it and get uncomfortable. So for instance, as soon as we went into lockdown and I was busy traveling around the world doing lots of speaking events, I realized that there are no speaking events when people aren't traveling and people can't see each other because of the virus. So I had to throw myself into doing a web TV show and to learn to be a virtual speaker. And as a non-technical person, it's really difficult to learn how it all works and comes together. But I was blessed to have a smart wife from Singapore who understands <laughs> tech and a smart daughter who understands iPads. And between them, they babysat my process until I was able to then do daily shows. So now I do events all around the world from my office. I don't go out of the house unless I go shopping because I'm still very cautious. And also, I mean, you know Dubai, I don't waste any time in traffic. I don't waste any time drinking coffee I didn't order. I don't waste any time making rubbish conversations with people while we're waiting for the boss to arrive for a meeting. Now with Zoom, I can go straight into conversations, get business done and move on. And my clients are worldwide. So you see, it's happened to be that your wife and your daughter, uh, your best team, your best partners, they managed to create, to connect digital world and talented speaker as you are, Dave. Tell me please about monetizing your talent. A lot of speakers, a lot of teachers, a lot of coaches who now trying to build their brands, trying to earn money and are not very successful because there are thousands of people who are talking, talking and telling, buy my product, buy my course, my online school is the best, buy my... How did you manage that you are just sitting, you are not drinking coffee in cafes that you don't like, but in your house, and you getting these clients and getting these offers? Why it's working with, with you and not working for others? What well, do you think? A couple of factors that come into this. The first one is the formula for why we get paid. Do you know why we get paid what we get paid for? Do you know why we get paid a certain amount and why we, will, why we, we don't get paid? I think we get paid uh, by, uh, for our expertise. And of course, if people like you, if they want to be like you, if they want to work with you, they will pay you. That's a very good answer. It's one of the best answers I've heard, but there's two parts to it. First of all, for your expertise and what you deliver. And secondly, how cheaply can I get somebody to deliver the same stuff that you deliver instead of you? 
So if you've got a, a room full of life coaches, I can get any one of them. And some are good, some are bad, but I can drive the price right down because I can say to a really good one, I can go over there and get somebody else. So give me a cheap price. So what you have to do is choose what you're brilliant at, choose what you love and choose what the audience wants and then really narrow it down to being the best at that one thing that you deliver. If you make it wide, other people can copy and they can drive the price down. If you can prove you're the best at it, and so if they go with anybody else, they're not gonna get the same quality, then you can charge what you want. So right now we have a world full of life coaches. Now there's two factors there. Anybody can be a life coach, and also people won't pay to be happy. They prefer to, to go out and party or, or go to Amazon and buy something. The idea of happiness is what everybody wants, but they think it should be free. So that's why life coaches find it so hard to get clients. Plus also for life coaches to get qualified, you spend maybe 20, about hundred hours free, free coaching before you get your certificates and then you can call yourself a life coach. People know they can get it for free. So why should they pay you? So when you've got so many life coaches coming into the world and doing hundred hours for free, it's really hard to monetize. So I would say the more you can choose a small area and make it a niche and a tiny area, it's like having a bit of paper. Here we are, I've got a sheet of paper. If I'm to push with a pen, it's gonna be difficult. But if I get the end of the pen with a little tiny edge like a pin, you go straight through. The reason it goes straight through is a focus. So the more focus you can pull, the more you can say, I only do this thing, but I do this better than anybody else in the world. And the more your brand can say this to the world, people will have no choice but to go with you, especially if you want to do it well. And also think about it. If this is your business, don't give it away for free. Maybe your clients at the highest level will pay more money using the 80-20 principle. The 80% of your money actually comes from 20% of your clients. And that means that you spend 80% of your time working on only 20% of a revenue because many people waste your time. If you can get that 20% who give you 80% of your money and work only with them, you've got a lot more spare time and a lot more time to invest in being a specialist. And when you do that again, 80-20 on top of an 80-20, it's called a 50 to one rule. And that works out that 1% of your clients actually present actually give you 50% of your revenue. So when you work what that out, what that is, and only concentrate on that 1%, you can really be a specialist and you get paid very well and you have a lot more time for your family. I think that you're already doing that, Dave, since you are looking very happy and you spend a lot of time with your family and you're doing a great job. I want to ask you the last question. Since you said and you showed me this great example about the pencil and paper, what do you think? What is that, if to say in five, ten sentences, what is that small, small niche that you are the best in the world? I'm an international virtual speaker and I train people on how to be international virtual speakers. That's what I do. I show people what I do and I teach them how to do the same thing. I'm a life coach. I'm a hypnotherapist. I do lots of other stuff, but other people do that. If you want to be a brilliant speaker on any platform, any live stage, any audience, anywhere, even creating a virtual speaker in a game set, a virtual platform, I do all that. And I can train you how to do that and monetize it and be the best in your industry. That's my very simple but easy to understand offer. Uh, that is absolutely great. I think that was uh, the gr a great example of pitch in the elevator or in Rolls Royce or in Mercedes, whatever you want, or on the beach in the Florida, but you're doing it very nicely, effortless, effortlessly. And uh, I will be very happy, Dave, to meet you again. Good luck to your business. Let it fly like a rocket. Good uh, luck to your wife and to your daughter, who are your biggest support. And I will be very happy to meet you again. Thank you so much, Dave, for being with us. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much.